Hey Lexi! Hi, hi! It's for me. I don't know if you're drinking coffee or not. No, she not coffee. It's evening. So Lexi, we're talking about COVID-19. Pretty much almost every person who's watching this probably heard a thing or two about it. I just want to break down some of the basics. COVID-19 is a disease you get from the coronavirus. And coronavirus is a wide range of viruses. They infect mammals, birds. What makes it super special is that it was able to jump from an animal to a human. And I believe this is the third type of coronavirus in the last 20 years that's been able to do that, right? We've had yes. SARS. MERS. And then this is actually SARS-CoV-2. So this is the second version of the original SARS coronavirus. So Lexi, what would you like to talk about today? I was going to talk about my work for the Arizona State University COVID-19 response team. We work in conjunction with the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, and we perform case investigations and provide specific areas of Phoenix food and other support for people who are isolated. It's all under Megan Jean in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change, and I know you've worked with her before. She's amazing. She's an epidemiologist who does a lot of work in social behavioral health. Can you talk a little bit more about what exactly you're doing? My main job right now is supervising case investigations. Ooh, can you please tell me, what is a case investigation? We get a list from the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, and when someone tests positive for COVID-19, they have some basic contact information information about them, usually their address, phone number, and their date of birth. They pass that on to us and we call them. We have a HIPAA secure confidential database. And so we call them and basically do an interview with them where we get some more demographic information, more information about what symptoms they've had, where they work, and then get a list of who they were in close contact with. For our purposes, close contacts are anyone that you have been within six feet of for more than 15 minutes. Mm. And we're specifically trying to get anyone that you were around in the two days before you started showing symptoms or before you got tested. Okay, to generate a list of everyone they've been in contact with and then you do the next step, which is what? So that would be contact tracing. Once you have that list of everyone that these people have been in contact with, you alert them, hey, you've been in contact with someone who has COVID-19 and you need to quarantine for 14 days. What is the difference between isolation and quarantine? So the big difference between them is whether or not you know you're infected. So if you're isolating, it's you already know you're infected. Quarantine is you don't know, but you're trying to stay away from everyone to make sure you don't spread it. Lexi, once you get on the phone with people and you're talking about it, how are you trained to reassure them that this is important and why they should do these inconvenient things? So I just wonder what kind of training or tips you have for communicating that risk. Yeah, it's definitely hard. We have scripts that we're given. A big thing is not to come at it from a place of shaming. You don't want to be like, oh, I can't believe you got on a plane when you felt sick. What's wrong with you? You never want to do something like that. You really want to be understanding. We do a lot of training on empathic communication, just constantly reminding our case investigators to use really active listening to let them know, hey, I hear you. I hear that you're concerned. And another big thing, especially when people don't want to stay home, it's like, oh, okay, I hear that you really are going to struggle with staying home for 10 days. What is the thing that is making you concerned about that? And then we can get more information. Is it that they're lonely? Is it that they're worried about not being able to go get groceries? And then we can connect them with resources that really make it a lot easier for them and hopefully convince them that it's not going to be that awful to isolate. And so one of these resources is this project, right? Yes. For Guadalupe, which is a specific area, for everywhere else, the Department of Health has a line that's a two-on-one line that we usually connect them with that and that can help them get information about food deliveries, things like that. Cool, cool, cool. So we talked at the beginning about how somebody might go get tested, find out they have COVID, and now you would be contacting them to get the list of contacts. Can you tell me what kind of testings are available right now? So right now there's three different kinds of tests. So there is a PCR test, that one basically is looking for the genetic material of the virus. Then there's an antigen test, and that's looking for the proteins that sort of live on the surface of the virus. And then there's an antibody test, which is looking for whether or not the antibodies that the virus spikes are in your immune system. And they all tell you a little bit different things, and they're all done in different ways. So the PCR test looks for if you have an active COVID-19 infection. It's the most accurate of all the tests. 
And that's the one that a lot of people have complained about where it's a nasal swab. Oh. And it goes way, way up in there because it's getting a sample of your nasal secretions. And then there's the antigen test. It's not as accurate as the PCR test, but it's a lot easier to do and you can get results a lot faster. So a lot of places are switching to using an antigen test. It's still telling you if you have an active COVID-19 infection. So that one, you basically spit or drool into like a little vial. And then the antibody test tells you if you've had COVID in the past. That one's somewhat accurate, and that one is done with blood, so you either do a full blood draw or a finger prick. One of the other things that we're doing at ASU with the COVID-19 response team is we're doing a seroprevalence study. Seroprevalence is the percentage of individuals in a population who have antibodies that would protect them against getting an infectious agent like a virus. And right now, we're not totally sure that having had COVID-19 once prevents you from ever getting it again, but it's still important to know who has had it, especially in the early days, like back in March, April, we really, really didn't have enough testing. And because so many people are asymptomatic, we just really don't have a good idea of how many people got it. Getting antibody tests now is a way to basically backdate that and be like, okay, this person has these antibodies, so they had it at some point in the past. Mm -hmm. Knowing how many people have had it is essential for calculating the r not and the death rate. You can't calculate those without actually knowing how many people have had it because if you just use the positive tests at the time, that's not the right number because more people have had it. And yeah. the same with the death rate, it's the number of people that have died that have tested positive isn't really the right number either because there could be people that you're not capturing. And so when you have these epidemiologists or right now random economists on Twitter that try and calculate those numbers using the data that we have based on just testing, they're not not really getting the full pictures, just not the correct number. And part of the problem with outbreaks and diseases like this is it takes a really long time to actually get those right numbers. It was decades before we had the right numbers for Spanish flu. Yeah, I mean, certain people self-select to test, right? And I was thinking for your study for seroprevalence, where are you getting the data from? Are you randomly selecting people? We're pretty unique in that there's only a couple of places that are doing a random sample for their seroprevalence study. No. So a lot of the numbers that you're seeing in the news right now when they talk about antibodies and the percentage of a population that tested positive for antibodies, they're using numbers that are based on who went out and got those tests. One thing to remember is those tests cost money. Like here in Arizona, one of the most popular ones, it's $150. That's enough money that you're going to exclude a large amount of the population. So in order to try and combat that and get a little bit more of an accurate number, we're trying to do a random sample. So we're actually going door to door in neighborhoods and going to every fourth house for free, offering to take the sample and get that data. And we'll obviously give it to them and then we have it. And we're able to use a representative sample and yeah. calculate that number of seroprevalence a lot better than if we're just using the numbers reported to us by the lab. Yeah. You know, getting those people who went out of their way to go get tested. That's a word. Like can you tell me a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I am a JD PhD candidate. So I got my law degree and I'm finishing up my PhD in sociocultural anthropology. But I've done a lot of focus on public health ethics and bioethics. And I actually teach as part of a course for first year med students at Mayo Medical School. And I teach the third year on the third year ethics course as well. Hey, Lexi, what would you like to learn more about? Ooh, okay. So I. I am obsessed with animal cognition. It's so interesting to me how we construct experiments to try and figure out how smart they are. I don't know if you've seen my other video where I am really interested in consciousness, how you transfer it to machines. It's really fascinating because a lot of the research about consciousness is right next to animal cognition because it's a big part of anthropology is what makes us human. How do we differentiate humans from other animals and computers? I mean, it's not a surprise we're both kind of obsessed with it as yeah. anthropologists. So obviously me finding a guest on this topic will make both of us happy. Yes. Lexi, thank you so much for your time. It was so fun.